Welcome once again in our ultrasound course step by step. Today we're going to discuss a very important topic, uh, ovaries, and uh, we're going to render it as usual as made easy uh, by our manner step by step. Uh, today we're going to discuss the ovaries, which is very important item, whether you're doing a pelvic abdominal examination or transvaginal examination. So let's remember together the items of our report. Okay. Um, whether we're doing uh, we're doing a pelvic examination in a uh, an abdominal examination or transvaginal ultrasound. Okay. There are items to be fulfilled. Of course, first we have to comment on the uterus. Okay, we have to comment on its size. Okay, whether it is infantile or normal, uh, whatever. And then we have to comment on the position, the antiverted or the traverted. And then we have to comment on the myometrium. Okay, whether there are focal lesions, uh, fibroids, adenomyomatosis, APM etc and then the endometrium we have to measure its thickness okay and uh, comment whether there is a hypoplasia polyps icd whatever and then the cervix okay and then the vagina right and then the adenex in which we have to integrate the ovaries. We have to comment on the ovaries, whether they are normal or there is something involving them. And then the tubes, okay, these are the adenexa, and then the pelvis in general, whether there is free fluid, there is abscess, mass, or if it is normal. Okay, so we have all of these um, items that we have to comment on. The uterine size position in the myometrium, the endometrium, the cervix, the vagina, the adenixa, and the pelvis in general. Okay, so let's return again to the ovaries. Of course, first we have to see the anatomy. Okay. These are the ovaries. They lie on both sides of the uterus. As such, voila. These are the ovaries. They are oblong shape or egg shape or yoid shape, whatever you name it. These they lie on both sides of the uterus. Now, what is the function of the ovary? Uh, the ovaries have two main functions. One that is to release the ovum every month. Okay, and second that is to produce the hormones. Okay. When it produces the ovum, okay, it gets caught by the fimbrial end of the fallopian tube and then it travels down the fallopian tubes, okay, till here. And if there is a sperm here, okay, it would fertilize the ovum and produce the zygote that is going to form later the baby. Okay, if this doesn't happen, okay, if this doesn't happen, the ovum along with the uterine lining, of course, will fall and uh, form the bleeding every month. Okay, so this is briefly the function of the ovary. Okay, let's see how it looks in the ultrasound. It is of utmost importance, of course, to train your eyes as to how they look okay voila this is the ovary it would look as such an ovoid or oblong or oval structure with follicles inside or with circles as such inside and here too okay structures with circles inside okay this is how it looks okay you have to recognize it all right Another example, okay, another one. Now, as to the orientation, if I tell you that the uterus, 
of kidneys located as such and the ovaries are on both sides would it be easier to locate it or to search for it by the transvaginal uh, sorry by the transverse approach or the longitudinal approach well the transverse approach because you would have a view panoramic view of the uterus with the ovaries along uh, its sides so it would be easier if you are in the trans abdominal examination trans abdominal transducer to search for the ovary with the transverse view okay of course we are going to see how to uh, search for it by the ls2 but it is easier by the ts okay it would look as such let's take a look at it now this is the uterus this is the uterus and these are the ovaries on its sides. This is the transverse view. So it is easier when you see the bladder and then you need to go and search for the uterus and then you would see the ovaries on its sides. Okay, it's of utmost importance that you imagine your view and how it is located in the patient. Now, this is the TS, okay? The probe is as such and the indicator is pointing towards the right of the patient. This is the right, okay, this is the indicator here. This is the right, this is the left. This is towards kephalic, towards the patient's head. This is towards the patient's feet, okay, and this is anterior and posterior, okay? So this is the TS. What about the LS? The LS, the indicator is here. It's pointing towards the patient's head. So this is kephalic. This is towards the coda, this is towards the patient's feet, all right? So this is anterior and this is posterior. This is the bladder and this is the uterus lies uh, behind the bladder as such. This is the Douglas pouch, okay? So this is your LS, all right? It's of utmost importance to imagine uh, the 3D uh, rendering of the ultrasound. Of course, it is 2D, but we have to imagine the rest, all right? Okay. All right. This is a very interesting uh, video I've shared with you in order to see these views, okay, real time. We'll start by the transabdominal approach, and here the uh, probe is LS. Okay. Now, in the LS view, as we said, the orientation is as such. This is the indicator. It is pointing towards the patient's uh, head. So this is kephalic and this is coda. That's to say this is the patient's feet and this is the patient's head. This is anterior and this is posterior. I locate the patient's bladder here. And then this is the uterus. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Now we are seeing the uterus and you might as well comment on its position. Okay, what is this position? Mm. Voila. Well, yeah. yeah. If I'm going to draw the vagina, the cervix, and the uterine body, I'm going to draw it as such, almost Z shape. So this is, if it is related as such, then it is anti inverted. And since the uterine body is uh, away from the bladder, it would be retroflexed. Okay, so this is the position. Okay, let's continue. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, this is another position. This is the reverted uterus, which the relation between the vagina and the uterine body is different. Okay, it is as such and as such. So the uterine body is looking or is, is away from the bladder and it is more related or looking to the rectum. Okay, so this is a retroverted. Okay. So just commenting on it. So of course, the details of this is in the lecture concerning the uterus. Okay, let's continue. All right. Okay, so as we have seen the, in the LS, it is uh, rather difficult to see the, the, the ovaries. Now we will see what about the uh, transverse view. 
of the ear, we replicate the bladder, and then we start to angulate the bow in order to see the uterus and then the ovaries. See, it is very easy to appreciate it. Relatively easy, of course. Angulate the bladder up and down, such. Voila, this is what we do. First, we replicate the bladder, then the uterus, and then the ovaries as we continue. This is important to angulate the bladder, the, the bow. Okay, in order to see it. All right. Now, this is the trans vagina. In the trans vagina approach, okay. First, this is the insertion. Okay, there's an important point here. If you insert the broom too deep, you will not be able to appreciate the uterine fundus and the ovaries along its sides. Let's see it diagrammatically. Okay, it be shown here. Yeah. See, he's trying to locate the bladder and the uterine and the uterus. Well, this is the uterus. Okay, to explain this point. Voila. Okay. When you insert the rope too deep, okay, you will not see the bone of the uterus and the ovary. As such, see, if you insert it too deep, you will not see anything. So we have to take the probe a little bit outwards or ask the patient to put something underneath her buttocks or put a pillow underneath her in order to see the rest of the uterus. Voila. As such, okay? So we have to take the probe a little bit outwards. This is the standard view. Now, it's very important to imagine what we are seeing. This is the probe inserted here, okay? So the probe is towards the patient's feet. That's why here is the patient's feet. Imagine this, this is the probe here. Okay, this is the probe. So this is the patient's feet, that's to say colon. And this is her head, towards her head, so this is kephalic. This is the patient's head, this is the patient's feet. All right? So anterior would be here, and posterior would be here. Why? Because the probe is inserted as such. Okay? This is your view. This is your view. So towards here is caudal. That's the patient's feet, and here is the patient's head. Okay, so this is the uterine body, All right? Okay, let's continue. All right, this is the standard view. First, I see the uterus. Okay, all right. Okay. We'll start to move the probe, okay, from side to side to appreciate the ovary. Now, this is important. When I move the probe, okay, here, the probe here, when I move the, okay, sec, okay, when I move the probe, this is the probe, the handle of the probe, towards the patient's feet, that's to say the left, its head will point to the right over, the contralateral side. Okay, and the vice versa. So I will move the probe from side to side to see both ovaries. Okay. Now, when I move the probe towards the patient's um, feet, the handle of the probe towards, let's say, the right feet, its head, okay, my view would be to the contralateral ovary. Let's see it real time. Okay, it's moving the probe from side to side. Okay, okay, voila. The probe and the handle is towards the left, so that its head points towards the right over. Okay, and vice versa. Okay. Uh, so it's moving the probe 
to move from side to side in order to and up and down, of course. This is the positions. Okay. This is the TS by the end of vaginal. Okay. All right. This is the TS. I will move it up and down in order to see the uterine body, fundus, and ovaries on both sides. Okay. Okay. Let's see the steps detail in detailed manner. Okay. As you see it. This is another video very interesting for the trans abdominal. Okay. Here we would uh, see the steps of how to locate it by the transabdominal approach. As we said, we start by the transverse approach. First, locate the bladder, and then the uterus, and then the iliac vessels on the sides. Of course, we will use the aid of the Doppler. Okay, so it will be precise to locate the iliac vessels and make sure that we are um, seeing them. Okay, this structure is the iliac vessels. And then we we'll start to angulate the probe a little bit. The ovary will be related to the iliac vessels. It's in direct relation to the iliac vessels and boana. This is the ovary. Okay, regardless of what it contains, this is the technique of how to locate it. First, the bladder, and then the iliac vessels on the side. We will use the Doppler to make sure this is the iliac vessels. And then angulate the probe a little bit, as we see in the picture here. Here. Okay, then we will see the voila. This is the technique of how to locate the ovary by the transabdominal approach. Okay, three simple steps. First, the urinary bladder, then the iliac vessels, we make sure by the doubler, and then we will see the ovary related to the iliac vessels. Okay, and then that's it. As we have seen, it is very easy by the transverse approach. Voila. This is how it looks. Okay. Here. How it looks on both sides of the uterus. The same man. Okay. Another video. Okay. This is the ring bladder. I will angulate the probe. Okay. These are the iliac vessels and these are the ovaries. Okay. Again, by the transverse approach. Picture. Okay. Hmm. Now, as to how to locate it by the uh, trans vaginal approach. Okay, we would see the LS, okay, in order to locate the urinary bladder and the uterus. And then we will make TS, okay, to see. Okay, yeah, this is the steps. First, locate the uterus by the LS. And then by the TS, okay. Okay. And then we will trace the tube. We will trace the tube on, si on the side of the uterus. And at the end of it, we will see the ovary as such. Okay. Okay. Voila, this is the uterus, and we would trace the ovarian ligaments, and then the ovary would be at its end. Of course, we'll make sure by the doubler, we will see the, here the iliac vessels, and it is related to it. Okay? This is the approach. This is the ovary, this is the iliac vessels. See the ovary here? Does it look like the classic picture? However, it is in its right anatomical position. Here it looks different. It has some something inside, whether it is a follicle, functional cyst, or cyst, support, whatever. We are here uh, making sure that this is the ovary. Okay. So again, the steps of locating the ovary by the transvagina. Of course, we would insert the probe as such and ask the patient to elevate 
her buttocks a little bit or put a pillow or take the probe a little bit outside to in order to locate this to see the uterus. Okay, and we will use the LS uh, to locate the uterus and then we will change to the TS and trace the ovarian ligament in order to see the ovary. Then we will return again to the LS and move it from side to side as such in order to appreciate the uh, ovary, uh, the right and left ovary. Okay, uh, we will move the probe to the contralateral leg as we see here. Okay, and see the other ovary. Right? Let's see the video here. It. Okay. This is the uterus. Okay. Moving the probe from side to side in order to see each open. This is an LS. Okay, and we are moving the probe from side to side to see the openings. Set. As such, weak, but we move it to the contralateral leg. Okay. The handle, we move the handle to the uh, left leg, we will see the right one, and vice versa. Now, to the measurements, we we'll have to take measurements, of course. Okay. Now, if you ask me, what is the best method to see the ovary? Well, try all of them. The best view you get, use all your methods to get the best view in order to see it uh, and uh, diagnose um, if there is something wrong with it. So, use all the methods, okay, whatever you use to see it right. Okay, sometimes the transabdominal is easier to locate it, sometimes the transvaginal, well, uh, there is no uh, right answer to this. Okay, what are the measurements here for the ovary? Well, there is very important dimension here. That is, it has not to increase five centimeters in any dimension. Now, this is an important figure here, okay, five centimeters. There are another figure that is 10 cc, it's volume. You would measure three dimensions, okay, in one view, two dimensions, and another in, the, uh, in another view, okay. Uh, and then you would calculate the volume, uh, whether by uh, the machine can calculate it for you, and if you don't have this, you would multiply all three dimensions and then divide it by two. Uh, the uh, result would be your volume. The important thing is it does not uh, increase over 10 cc and in any dimension it does not exceed 5 centimeters. Okay? These two figures is very important. Here the measurement of the volume, okay, we will take two measurements in one view and then another measurement in another view as such, okay, and then we calculate the dimension one, two, and three, one, two, and three, calculate the volume, okay, if the important thing does not exceed 10 cc's, and then any dimension does not exceed five, so these are the two very important figures to remember concerning the measurements. Okay, now to the lesions of what we were going to see involving the ovaries. This is very, very, very important as it is very common. Okay, what are the changes in the ovary? The ovary, as well as the endometrial lining, would follow the cycle every month. Okay, there are changes every month in the ovary corresponding to the changes in the uh, endometrium, okay, and of course we'll correlate them together. First, 
we have this follicle, okay? And uh, you might wonder, do we see the ovum or the follicle? Yeah, we see all of these steps, okay, as we will see it. Now, what will happen here? The follicle, every month, one of them, okay, increases in size, all right? And it increases and increases until it ruptures the follicle and it releases the ovum. This is at the time of ovulation. Okay, then the rest of the follicle would form the corpus luteum. And then the corpus luteum will decrease, decrease, decrease until it forms the corpus albicans. Okay. Okay, so this cycle lasts around two, uh, 28 days, okay? And it corresponds to the, um, the cycle by the endometrium. Okay, let's take a look here. Here again, the cycle, the follicles, then it enlarges and becomes the dominant follicle. And you see the cyst with the cyst appearance. And then uh, the follicle ruptures and the ovum is released. The rest of the follicle forms the corpus albicans. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, the corpus luteum, right? And this is the corpus luteum. At its end, it forms the corpus albicans. So this is the ovary. Okay. With its follicles inside. So at the beginning of the cycle, we don't see anything. Perhaps we see only the corpus luteum of the previous cycle. Okay, now here one of the here this is one of the follicles start to enlarge. This is the follicular phase. Okay, here one only start to enlarge. Okay, and becomes the dominant follicle. One or two. Here we are from the day six to day twelve. Right, so. We we'll start to see one of them in the, this is corresponds to this phase. Okay. And then this is when the ovulation is imminent. That's to say it's just about to happen. Here we see the uh, appearance of cyst within cyst. All right. This is the follicle with the ovum inside. So here is the ovulation is just about to happen. All right. This is the ovum and the secondary ovum side inside it. So this is the pre ovulatory. Okay. All right. Or the ovulation is just about to happen. So if you are in the uh, follicular uh, then this is a sign that the ovulation is just. About that, and give you a little tip here. Okay, you are following up a patient. Okay, for ovulation, that's to say the follicularity. All right, and you see in your examination, this is the uterus. Okay, and the two ovaries here, one here and the other is here, and I see here uh, dominant follicle or big follicle. Okay. And another here. Okay, this is, uh, let's say, 25 millimeters, and this is 16 millimeters. But here, so this this seems to be the largest, so or the larger. So perhaps the ovulation is just about to happen. Okay, but here I see this appearance, the cyst within cyst. Which one is about to rupture? Which one is the one that's going to produce the ovum? Well, this one. The cyst within cyst is a sure sign of ovulation. So I would say that this ovum still hasn't acquired, this one still hasn't acquired the optimum size. Okay, if I said uh, there will be a guy in your obstetrician who is following up with my patient, but this is the one that's about to ovulate and it hasn't still gained the, the desirable size. Why? Because the cyst to the cyst is sure sign uh, that ovulation will take place on this side. Okay, so this is the importance uh, of knowing the details uh, 
in the judicial process. So it's not just about the site, right? So this importance of this this appearance, this sure sign that the judicial is just about to happen. Okay. After the ovulation happens, what will happen? I will have no signs of ovulation. This is around 15 or 17 days. I will see that the follicle, it was uh, uniform in appearance. It was uh, like, as in here. Here, it will start to look irregular because it has ruptured. Okay, I will see some free fluid and the patient may suffer from some uh, pain okay, at the side of the ovary in which the ovulation has happened. I might also see blood work as in here inside the, uh, the ruptured follicle. So all of these are the signs of um, ovulation. And if I'm following up this patient, I will see that this uh, follicle has decreased in size, which means that it has ruptured. Okay, so these are the signs that will tell me that ovulation has just happened. This is immediately after uh, ovulation. Okay. Here, uh, near the end of the cycle, this is the luteal phase, the formation of the corpus luteum, the rest of the follicle after the, the release of the ovum. It will look as such. It's very characteristic in appearance. It will happen every month, so I might uh, encounter it in many, many, many patients because it will happen every month, okay? It will look as such, right? With a regularity inside resembling star shaped okay? Um, so this is how the corpus luteum would look like at the end of the cycle. Okay. This is the normal ovary. Okay. In the end, this is um, the follicular phase when one follicle starts to launch. This is the dominant follicle, the largest one. Okay. This is the uh, mature follicle. Okay, here. Ovulation is just about to happen. Here, the ovulation has just happened. And this is still in cystinosis. Doesn't happen. Another one. Here we have two um, ova and two secondary oocytes. Would you uh, suggest, that, or would you think that if this ovum is fertilized, it will produce twins? Well, yeah. Here, this is the TM phase, the corpus TM start to form, and this is uh, the stage just after ovulation. Here, because I see free fluid here, I see some blood fluid here, I see uh, emery irregularity, okay, and the corpus TM starts to form. Okay, here there is blood flow inside, okay, a sign of ovulation. All right, blood flow inside. Okay. This is the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum has the appearance of ring of fire. If I use the doppler, it has the appearance of ring of fire. Okay. This is the star shape inside. Corpus luteum again. Again, here the corpus luteum. Okay. This is a video. We're going to see it real time. Observe. This is the ovary. Some follicles are not here. And this is the corpus luteum. So, this is the end of the cycle. And there's a very important note that uh, the uh, follicle or the corpus luteum or cyst or cyst will never exceed three centimeters. Okay. Is important, and as we're going to see later, this is what differs in the ovarian cyst from all the functional cysts inside. Now, this is the ring of fire we've talked before when we use the doubler, the color box here, or the corpus luteum. It will show us this ring of fire, as in this line, and jumping toward the ring of fire in the surface, it's named after such. Okay, okay, this is the ring of fire, it's in the wall of the corpus luteum. Not in the ovary, okay? Or the corpus luteum inside the ovary at the end of the cycle. Here, this is absolutely normal. This is the corpus luteum 
in the end of the cycle. Now, this is very interesting. This is the coupling, the correlation between the ovarian cycle and the uh, menstrual cycle in the uterus. Okay, they both correspond to each other. So when I'm making my ultrasound examination, I can see both, and this one verify the other. Let's see it together. This is the different stages. This is uh, early, okay, uh, zero to five when there is uh, the ovary is as such, and this is the remnants inside the uterus, we just in the beginning of the cycle. Uh, this is the remnants of the previous cycle. Here I might see the corpus chain of the previous cycle. Here, this is the follicular phase. Okay, when one follicle starts to enlarge, okay, this is the dominant follicle, and it never exceeds three centimeter. This corresponds to the proliferative phase in the, uh, in the, uterus, okay, we call it the early proliferative phase, all right, you see that the, the two basal layers as such here, beginning to thicken, all right, so, here, this is the cyst within cyst, okay, and the uterus starts to uh, thicken, the uterus. The endometrium starts to thicken, giving us the appearance of triplet layers or sandwich appearance. Okay. And then here, ovulation has just happened. This is the corpus luteum, and this is the endometrium shows peripheral thickening as well. Peripheral thickening here. Okay. Here, this is peripheral thickening in the endometrium. Um, here, this is the corpus luteum, the luteum is here. This is ovulation has just happened, ovulator. This is the corpus luteum or the luteal phase. This corresponds here to ecogenicity uh, in the endometrium that is thickening in the endometrium. Okay, so these are the stages, different stages in the endometrium along with the ovary. Let's take them one by one, all right. Here, the ovary, and zero to five. Uh, here, this is the corpus luteum of the previous cycle, and the endometrium shows some fluid and blood clots in the early in the cycle, the days of menstruation. Okay, afterwards, from day five to nine, this is proliferative phase or follicular phase, follicular phase in the ovary and proliferative phase in the endometrium. The endometrium is still thin and the ovary show uh, small follicles. No, there is no one that is a, that is particularly large. This is early proliferative phase and follicular phase from five to nine days. Here, this is the preparation for ovulation. So we see one or few mature follicles in the ovary that corresponds to the beginning of thickening of the endometrium. This is 10 to 9, okay? This is the pre ovulatory when I see cyst within cyst, as a near cyst within cyst. Okay, secondary oocyte starts to appear inside the mature follicle, the dominant follicle. This corresponds to the endometrium forming the three line appearance or the sandwich appearance, okay? All right, then this is the ovulation. Ovulation has just happened. Okay, and I see here what are the signs of ovulation. The corpus luteum is formed. I see irregularity inside the dominant follicle and it is decreased inside. Inside of it, I see blood clot. The, the corpus luteum is still not formed. Here, this, what I see earlier refers to the clots. All right, it, it is just it will be formed. Okay, here the, the follicle has ruptured. So it starts to look irregular. This is not the corpus luteum yet. And then there is some free fluid. Okay, I see some blood clot. I see some irregularity. I see decrease in the size. The patient tells me that she's feeling pain in the side in which uh, the population has happened. All right, these are the signs of uh, ovulation. All right, this corresponds to the still the three layer appearance. However, there is increased ecogenicity in the periphery. Okay. The uterus, the uterus is starting to thicken and its line is starting to thicken. Here, the, 
which is the name the security phase. Here, this is little TM phase, all right? The corpus the TM has been formed, and I see the ring of fire here, okay? And uh, this corresponds to thickening and epigenicity, intrinsic epigenicity in the intermediate, that's also called secretory phase. Okay. Here, uh, this is the ovary uh, in, in menopause. When I see the corpus luteum, many corpus luteum, that we've said that forms the corpus albicans. Okay, they form the corpus albicans here, corpus albicans. So, uh, in menopause or perimenopausal or postmenopausal, the ovary, of course, starts to shrink in size. And I see these many, many, many corpus albicans, the previous cycles. The, they were corpus luteum, but they start to fibrose and start to um, shrink in size and amplify, and they form these corpus epigens as such. Okay, so this is how it looks. All right, um, the ovary uh, starts to shrink, and I see this epigenic foci. They correspond to the corpus epigens. Uh, in young females, the uh, the ovary, uh, by the way. Uh, the ovary is small, okay, but it might be a little bit enlarged at, uh, at birth uh, due to the effect of the, the uh, maternal hormones that is being tra transferred to the baby through the placenta. Okay, so I might see a, a little baby uh, girl. Uh, the ovary is, is not so very small as we would expect it to be uh, due to the hormones of the mother. And by the same token, you might see some ovarian cyst in a young baby from zero to six months or even in utero because she has um, the maternal hormones affecting the ovary producing such a picture. However, after that, it's, uh, it, uh, it is very small and shrink in size and we don't see it clearly uh, until the puberty. After puberty, I will see the, the ovary as we have described, okay? Now, this is very important, the blood supply of the ovary. Okay, the blood supply of the ovary, the ovary receives blood supply from two sources. This is very important. Okay, from the ovarian artery, ovarian artery here, and ovarian artery here, ovarian artery, ovarian artery, and from the uterine artery. Here is the picture, and voila, this is the uterine artery. Okay, it supplies the ovary, the uterine artery supplies the ovary and the ovarian artery. So it has double blood supply. This is very important. We're going to see how. The right ovarian artery comes directly from the aorta and the left ovarian artery here, voila, comes from the adrenal artery. Okay, let's see. And the venous drainage follows um, the blood supply. The right ovarian vein uh, is drained directly into the IPC while the left uh, ovarian then drains to the uh, left renal vein and then the IPC. Okay? Right. This is the venous drainage. Okay? Yeah. As we've said, that the um, left and the right renal vein okay, drains directly to the IPC, while the left renal vein drains to, sorry, the left ovarian vein drains to the left renal vein and then to the IPC. All right, okay. Why is this important? I'm going to tell you why this is important. This is very interesting. But I'll give you a hint, and of course, it will be also discussed later in details when we study the torsion. Okay, this is the over. All right, it receives blood supply from the ovarian artery and from the uterine artery. All right. And this is the, the um, ovarian vein. All right. So in torsion, in torsion, what will happen? This is torsion. This is, is blocked. All right. So part of the blood supply is blocked, and all the venous drainage is blocked. So what will happen to this ovary? Is it deprived from blood supply? No. So by the Doppler, what did I see? I would still see arterial flow because the flow from the train artery, <coughs> pardon, 
the flow from the uterine artery is still present here. So it's still present. And as there's still flow, some arterial flow, it's going to the ovary, but there is no venous drainage. This ovary will what? Will start to enlarge, enlarge. So in case of torsion, what will I see? I will see increased in size ovary. This is very important. As we said, the ovary has not to exceed two important dimensions, five centimeters in any dimension and 10 cc in volume. So this would change. I would see it enlarged because it receives blood supply from some arterial flow, some arterial flow from the uterine, uh, but there is no drainage. So in torsion, contrary to the certain belief that we would see no color flow, no blood flow, I would still see some arterial flow, but there is no venous flow and there is increased in some. Okay, so this is really very important. Okay, to understand this, to appreciate this, because do not exclude torsion because you see arterial flow or some flow. This flow is arterial due to the uterine, but there is torsion. And this is very, very dangerous situation. It's actually life-threatening. So it's really important that you understand this. Okay. Of course, we will discuss this in details later, but this is an important hint. Okay, since we've mentioned the blood supply. Now to the first uh, pathological vision we're going to discuss, the simple ovarian cyst. Now this is very common diagnosis, but it's important to diagnose it precisely because some people misdiagnose the functional cyst with ovarian cyst. So what is the ovarian cyst, a simple ovarian cyst? Okay, let's decipher it. A simple ovarian cyst. Okay, simple ovarian cyst. Cyst means that this is an echoic structure. The cyst, so this is an echoic. And uh, being a cyst, it has thin wall. Being a cyst and a coke and has thin wall, it has posterior shadowing. Okay? Or posterior enhancement. Here, posterior enhancement. Okay? So, this is cyst. Ovarian remind us that it is more than three centimeters. It is not functional. If it is exceeds three centimeters, this is the cutoff, then yeah, this is an ovarian cyst. Simple means that we have certain criteria in the coming slide, we discuss them. Okay. Seven criteria. Symbols equals seven. Okay, let's see those seven in order to remember. Okay. This is a, a, a simple uh, ovarian cyst. Look at this. This is more than three centimeters. The thin wall. It is an echo with posterior enhancement. And the the seven items being what? Let's cite them together. We have three positive and four negative. The three positive being it is. N equal, it is thin, it is, it has posterior enhancement. The items of cyst we've mentioned. The four negative, there is no septation. I have to make sure that all of the four is negative. So I would say, yeah, it is thin. No septation, no calcification, no soft tissue module, and no vascularity inside. Okay. If this lesion is more than three centimeters and it has all of this criteria, then yeah, this is a simple ovarian cyst. If it is less than three centimeters, it is not a cyst. It is not a cyst. Okay, so these are the criteria. Let's take a look at the ovarian cyst. This is an ovarian cyst. Okay, this is follicle that is less than three centimeters here. 
So no, this is not a cyst. This is just a fault. Okay. There is some uh, uh, rule here. It's not so very important, but okay, it's worth mentioning. If in the first week and you see cyst that's one centimeter, then this follicle is two centimeter in the second week, then brings the dominant follicle three centimeter in the third week. So this is the formless medium. But if it is four centimeter, that's to say more than three centimeter, then it is none of these and it is a cyst. Okay, just to remind you of the phases and the numbers. This is more than three centimeters, this is a cyst. This is more than centimeter, this is a cyst. It is any code, it has posterior enhancement, there is no septation inside, there is no calcification, there is no soft tissue nodule, and the no vasculature. Regarding this um, doubler, okay, it's all away, but there is nothing here inside. So, yeah, this is simple ovarian cyst. Now, if I see simple ovarian cyst and I would write, of course, and mention it in my report. What do I recommend this patient to do? To come again and follow it up, whatever the cyst size was, well, my recommendation depends on the patient being high risk or low risk. So what is this high risk, risk or low risk? Well, there are certain criteria. If it is present in the patient, then it would mean that this is high risk. First, if she is post menopause. Uh, second, if she has family history of uh, breast cancer of ovarian or ovarian cancer. Third, if she has done genetic mapping and she knows that she has uh, one or two genes that predispose to breast or ovarian cancer as a BRCA gene 1 or BRCA gene 2. As a very famous actress, you might uh, as well have heard of it, Angelina Jolie. She has done mastectomy, but that was mastectomy. I don't know if she's done has the one of rectum two or not, but she has BRCA gene uh, positive, and that's why she's, she's done mastectomy. Okay, so uh, some people uh, might have uh, done this genetic mapping if they have a strong family history, and they might know this. So if I know that the patient is as such, well, this puts her into the category of high risk too. Okay, so the high risk, again, if she's post menopause. If she has family history of breast or ovarian cancer, or if she has one of the corporate genes that predispose to these cancers. If not, then the patient is low risk. Okay. You might as well not memorize this. Just print it out in your clinic and uh, refer to it later. When you see a simple ovarian cyst, you can check it. You can check it. And there are too, so many things to memorize. <laughs> All right. This is another chart that you might as well print it in your clinic in order to place your patient in one of these. Now, first you have to identify the patient. Is she low risk or high risk? What I want you to remember in all of this chart is this magic number seven. If the sample cyst is more than seven, whether she's low risk or high risk, high risk, this uh, merits uh, uh, further uh, investigation as an MR, I or even surgery. Okay, if it is more than seven centimeters, this is the cutoff, then it uh, this qualifies for further management as an MR or search, whether she was low risk or even high risk. The same number applies, seven centimeters. I would make MR or surgery in post cases. And numbers less than seven centimeters, well, it depends. Of course, the cutoff in all cases is three. The cutoff in the high risk, it's a little bit, uh, it's less, it's two. Okay. If it is less than three, do not mention in your report. Okay. It is functional. If it is from three to five and she is low risk, all right. It's most certainly benign. Mention, but do not follow up. If it is from five to seven, well, you would already mention it, of course, but she might need follow up, but yearly. This is not so very wor uh, worrying. Um, Mostly it would be benign, it would be benign. However, yearly follow-up is recommended, okay? But if it is more than seven centimeters, no, no follow-up. Directly do MR research. Here in the high risk, if it is from two to seven, she will, this will merit follow-up, okay? Uh, yearly follow-up until it is resolved, okay? So the follow-up is for the high risk, but the follow-up for the low risk only if it is from five to seven. Do not uh, do not memorize it. Just know it and have it on your mobile or print it out. 
This is a simple ovarian cyst, and the patient is 25, so is she high risk or low risk? Mm. Low risk, because she is three uh, menopausal, of course, and she's young, okay? And the, there is not mentioned that she has family history of uh, cancer. But here, look at the dimensions of the ovarian cyst. Um, it is big. So do I tell her to do follow-up or to do what? Absolutely right. MR direct link or surgery. Okay. Cannot wait for this. This is too big. Cannot ignore it. And this patient has proved to be cystadenic. Okay. Here, the patient also has simple ovarian cyst and she's 75 years old. Is she high risk or low risk? Uh, most certainly she is high risk. And in all cases, the dimensions, look at this, this is huge, it's big, okay? Of course, directly surgery or MI and also both of the system, serious system, okay? All right, this is the end of part one and uh, stay tuned for the coming part.